Welcome and good evening to all of you. It's really nice to see so many faces here. Uh, I'm Arun Chandra. I'm one of the three faculty that taught this course. And there's Elizabeth Williams and Ben Kapp, my colleague. Um, they're, they're, uh, what you'll see this evening, um, does everyone who wants a program have one? I'm guessing that's a yes. OK, good. So you'll see five scenes tonight. And uh, each of the scenes was created and rehearsed by the people who you will see performing them. Okay? And the general assignment for the whole class was initially to take uh, something that's of interest in American history to them from a certain period, but we were lax about the, um, the, re the distance, the range of that period. But mostly people were uh, addressing themselves to the years 1890 to 1920, what's called the progressive era. And the first three weeks of the class, each student wrote a research pa uh, paper on something of interest during that time. Then in the next three weeks of the class, the students worked in groups at taking what they had researched and putting it into a single play. It was up to the groups whether they decided to take all the topics of the research that each group, mem the group members did, or to choose some subset of that total collection, either one or two or three of the things they had studied. Then the next three weeks, they rehearsed these scripts that they had written. And in the last week, which is this week, we've performed them. We've performed them at uh, two high schools in Olympia and uh, the, an art high school up in Tacoma. And uh, I think we've had a good time doing that. So this is the last performance we're giving. And I hope you enjoy it. And I hope uh, you have things to say. Because one of the aspects of writing these plays and performing them is to find out what are the consequences of doing something. Sometimes people think that art is self-expression only, but art can also be something that seeks a response from its audience. And sometimes artists can build things, present them to find out what does it invite, for instance, <laughs> so, welcome. <laughs> Our group is called Operation Whitman, and we hope you enjoy our play. Good morning, everyone. Please find your seats so we can begin. Detention. Detention. <laughs> I need your paper cake. Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, so we have a very exciting lesson ahead of us. All right, now for introductions, we're going to spend today talking about one of America's best known poets, Walt Disney. You say Walt Disney? Walt Disney. <laughs> Eli. Eli. Do you have a no? No. I'm sorry, but this is the third week, third time this week that you've been late. I'm going to have to write you a citation. Mm -hmm. I hope you do everything to clean your closet. Sorry, Miss Thompson, but. I've got more important things on my mind than getting to class on time. Oh, oh, <laughs> now, Walt Whitman was born in 1819 in Long Island. He actually had a really interesting and fascinating beginning of life. He was a nurse in the Civil War. <sighs> Great. More useful information. Can't wait for Walt Whitman to teach me how to file my taxes. This looks like the perfect opportunity for a nap. Eli! Eli! Eli. Mm. 
during your lesson. And you're yelling at me during the lesson. Miss Thompson's gonna come over here any second. Does my swag offend thee? <laughs> Listen here, enough questions. You'll have answers in due time. We're here to teach you something. And you seem reluctant to learn. <laughs> okay, Ryan. I don't know what prank you're trying to pull, but this is, <laughs> this is no prank. I suppose we should introduce ourselves. I am Emily. I know who you are, you're- Never gonna get anywhere with you interrupting every minute. Now hush. Thank you. Now. This is Edgar Allan Poe. You may know the Raven. I am Emily Dickinson, apparently an esteemed poet. I wouldn't know, considering that I died before anything I wrote was ever published. And this is William. Bro, thou shalt take to our teachings the way thou takes to slumber. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> that, so, William, like William Shakespeare, the guy that cut off his ear? You are so dumb, it's making my depression worse. <laughs> Shakespeare, one of the most renowned playwrights of all time. He's so good, why did he cut off his ear? <laughs> now listen, Eli. Oh. We're both there, Eli. Okay? Now, if you can learn a thing or two from Walt Whitman's experiences as a poet. I purposefully fell asleep so I wouldn't have to hear about some rich white poet dude, yeah? Okay, lessons scarcely done. Walt wasn't rich. In fact, he left to work school. He left school to work and earn income for himself and his family. He struggled financially, just like you and your family. Whoa, 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 hold on. How would you know anything about my family? When you die, you get to know everything. For instance, I know you were late this morning because you worked morning shift, and I'm sorry Miss Thompson doesn't want to understand this. Thanks. You know, I was very poor as a young man as well. <coughs> There were times in my life I had to burn my own furniture to stay alive. But that didn't keep me from pursuing my dreams. As I see, you have done as well. Those are nothing, just notes and nonsense. That's exactly how I started, notes and nonsense on the back of paperwork I should have been studying. <laughs> Homies of a few words are the best of homies. Hell, Walt's <laughs> Leaves of Grass began as 12 poems. No, giant book. Precisely. He revised and added to that collection his whole career. You know, you got some real potential here. says they're a waste of time, okay? And my sister says they're not that good. I never even showed my writings to my sister. The fact that you could share yours speaks volumes. And you think everyone loved Walt Whitman right away? He took a lot of criticism for his taboo topics. But why? What could this old guy possibly have to write about that would be so shocking to the public? Here, why don't you see for yourself? Read from... Here the frailest leaves of me. Here the frailest leaves of me, and yet my strongest laughter. Here I shade and hide my thoughts. I myself do not expose them, and yet they expose me more than all my older poems. Good. And <coughs> this one. I sing the body electric. That of the male is perfect and that of the female is perfect. The expression of the face false account, but the expression of a well-made man appears not only in his face, it is in his limbs and joints also. It is curiously in the joints of his hips and his wrists. It is in his walk, the carriage of his neck, the flex of his waist and knees. Dress does not hide him. The strong, sweet quality he has strikes through the cotton and broadcloth. To see him pass conveys as much as the best poem, perhaps more. You linger to see his back, 
on the back of his neck and shit himself. And this one, a glimpse. Glimpse through an interstice cough of a crowd of workmen and drivers in a bar room around the stove, late of a winter night. And I, unremarked, seated in a corner of a youth who loves me and whom I love, silently approaching and seating himself near, they may hold me by the hand. A long while amid the noises of coming and going and drinking an oath and smutty jest, there we too, content, happy in being together. And this one. O oh, you, whom I often and silently come. O oh, you, whom I often and silently come where you are, that I may be with you. As I walk by your side or sit near, or remain in the same room with you, little you know the subtle electric fire that for your sake is playing within me. And my personal favorite, that shadow my likeness. That shadow my likeness that goes to and fro, seeking livelihood, chattering, chasing. How often I find myself standing and looking at it where it flits. How often I question and doubt whether that is really me. But among my lovers and caroling these songs, oh, I never doubt whether that is really me. So, gay. He's gay. Now you see. Now you get it why won't matter. I, I don't even write about being gay this obviously. I had no idea, so he's famous for writing poetry about being gay. Well, kind of. Basically, yes, but your teacher might not tell you that, though. Tina, listen, Eli. We want you to know you're not alone in your walk of life. Others have come before you that know your struggle and share your pain. Walt found his own way to cope through writing, just as you have. <clears throat> That's really sentimental and all, but, uh... Sis RQ, looks like it's time for us to break it down for you. Oh my god, you two promised you wouldn't do it this time! We lied. We lied. Let's go help you're happy. Hey, it's nice. About to get a million times worse, I'm sorry. <laughs> my name is William Shakespeare. What I'm about to say is very top tier. I'm no puppeteer. I'm gonna need y'all to hear. Listen to me very clear. Listen to me right here. Maybe even end dear. The words I'm about to spit are very crucial, very sub dear. Get up off those gramophones. Ooh, I fucked up my feelings. I'm just trying to connect with thee, but under no circumstance will I plead. Fellas, stop acting like a clown, it's not Halloween. Stop trying to get in between and treat whom you love like royalty. What the hell ever happened to loyalty? After all, at one point or another, we have all loved with the love that was more than love. The shows are all fighting battles no one knows about. But please, even in your darkest hours, when you feel like there's no way out, please have no doubt. Just know that poetry is a real way to go about. To go about? They say, keep your face always to the sunshine and shadows will fall behind you. However, this pain is too much to bear. You ask me about being happy? Yeah, yeah that's, that's rare. rare. Let me explain. Awaken to the pressing rain. The pressing An almost rain? replica of my deep inside pain. I guess what I'm trying to say is, I can never understand how you all are feeling, but I just want you to know, you are, you not, are not alone. Well, this just keeps getting weirder and weirder. Really though, thanks guys. I'll admit, I really appreciate what you showed me. I had my doubts at first, but this was, Honestly, pretty intriguing. I'm thinking, though, it's kind of time to wake up. There are more hidden answers out there than you may think. Good luck moving forward. Hey, uh, thanks for uh, breaking it down for me, buddy. Plus a pleasure, yes? <laughs> to let other people's criticisms limit my potential. I'm not going to stop writing. Very well. 
You should sit down now. You'll be waking up any minute. Hey, some achieve greatness, and some are born great. Achieve yours, bro. Thanks. <laughs> New York City, 1912. This is the line we're going to be starting out. Lady. Lewis, you'll be here next to Catherine. Here's Kathy, Helen, and Ruth. When the blocks come down the line, arrange them as such and pass them down. Ruthie here. Ruthie's our quality tester. Any questions? Uh, no, sir. Anything comes up, you find me on your break. Back to work. <sighs> Jesus, thank God. <sighs> if I had to keep working at that rate, can I sit hammer for a while, please? Up here, arrange them like this, easier on the wrists. Getting soft on the new guy already? Helen, could you not? Well, it, you can never be too careful. That's right. Just last week, Dorothy left on a stretcher from hammering. You know, I kind of like the routine myself. I figured I could use the same motion in my cooking. It really speeds things along. I only get home a bit before Howard these days. And I have to have the cleaning done and the dinner ready. Are you telling me that you toiled a day away here and that husband of yours still expects you to cook and keep house? Don't forget to have his lunch ready as well. You don't say. Don't get us started. Well, you know, it's not so terribly awful. I an hour and a half before Howard, I put on my best apron and get to work. Craig came in, but he wasn't looking too well, so I... Dinner! What's this meant to be? Shepherd's pie. And would the shepherd take it back? Oh, honestly. A wife has certain responsibilities, Helen. I provide for you to be sure you can provide for me and for the children. Howard, we don't have children. It's a talking back! For a marriage to work, Helen, there are steps that must be taken, regulations that must be followed. Man weds woman. Man goes to work to support their household. Woman cleans house. Woman cares for man after his long, back-breaking day. These are the rituals of holy matrimony, Helen. <sighs> Helen, your wifely duties are the foundation of Western society. They are, they are what separate our race from the savages. Slack on the home front puts our very nation in danger. And a wife's duty to the nation. Comes before her duty to the employer. Well, that is all well and good, Howard, but the nation is not paying my wages or putting food on the table. Have you been talking to that girl at the factory again? She's my coworker. What am I supposed to do, ignore her? Well, you know she's a communist, a red. And what about it? What's so wrong about all those things, Howard? About fair pay? An eight-hour workday? Divorce? Divorce. You want a divorce. Maybe I do. It will ruin you. I know. It's not so awful, though. An easy enough arrangement to live with. I'm sure we could never hear a group like that. <laughs> well, no, Ruth, you're a unlikely sort of girl. She's 
independently minded. I suppose I fancy myself well read. Ding, 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 ding. Oh. Wasn't that the break bell? Dollars are not made on idle hands, dear. Boss, good to see some initiative on the line again. It's been like three days in a row now. How's everything coming along, Ruthie? Just fine, sir. Glad to hear it. I do wish you'd stop at that Ruthie business. It's a bit familiar. Well, we all call you Ruthie, don't you? And what about that boy you run about with? Um, Arthur, is it? Ruthie! Ruthie, Miss Catherine, it's so delightful to see you. You too, Artie. Will Robert be joining us today? Uh, no, he had an errand to run. He'll be by later. It's a wonderful day for a date, though, isn't it? It's so good to have time with all of us again. Don't you love the spring, Ruthie? It's dreadful. Really? Soon the factory floor will be as hot as the devil, and we'll all be dropping like flies while that foreman sits in his office reading a magazine with his head in the icebox. Don't be morbid, darling. Oh, look, here comes Robert now. Baby. Family. By God, it took you long enough. We thought you'd been kidnapped or something. <laughs> I've missed you all. So where are we going to eat? Papa Luigi's. Oh, no. No. Too much grease. What? We went there just last week. Yes, and it was far too greasy. I rather like grease. Catherine, surely you can't deny this poor working woman her grease. I can and I shall. <laughs> well, we must go without Papa Luigi's. How about Jimmy's? Mm. Ugh, sandwiches. Well, I love a sandwich. Arthur, we eat sandwiches day in and day out. What side are you on here? These are gourmet sandwiches, they say, straight from Paris. Well, if you'll pardon me, I don't think I need the French to tell me how to put cheese between bread. So, how have we all been? Oh, you know, day by bitter day. What's her mood, Kathy? It's my the factory. My mood makes sense for my job. The pay is garbage. Hours are garbage, and that foreman is getting on my last nerve. We, have, we, we all have to do something about these conditions. Here we go again. We need to unionize. Bruce, it's too risky. Even with things as bad as they are, we'd be fired, and then where would we be? On the streets, that's where. But if it works, and, we get and conditions improve, it'll be an example for factories all over the city. How do you know the factories around the city actually want it? Robert, just because you work with I don't know police, about you but I feel in our position, we shouldn't be drawing too much attention to incidents. If I were running this society, Robert, you'd be free to kiss men right in the park and no cop. Ruthie, oh my God, you yes. are so bold. Oh, who's my little labor organizer? <laughs> Hi, guys. Lewis. What are you doing with your day off? Oh, we are just out with our men who we love. Ruth and I love men. <laughs> Don't we all? What are you doing out today? Looking for work. 40 cents an hour is not going to cut it. 40 cents? It's unlivable. Right. <laughs> well, good luck. <laughs> 40 cents? Well, how much are you making? 25. Unbelievable. I'm not going to stand for this kind of treatment anymore. I'm going to unionize Ka Kathy, and I'd like to see you or that foreman try to stop me. employment offices. I'm looking to board the Titanic. Is that that Titanic? <laughs> Are you mad, boy? You, you must be new around here. There's a lot of talk going around about that ship. I did hear they were looking for more workers when they got here. God, did you ever wonder why a ship so close to port is still looking for workers at its maiden voyage? Because it's big. God! <laughs> add em up, boy, just add em up. It's all a bit fishy, that's what I'm saying. What's so fishy about it? Well, you see. <laughs> a friend 
sister's brother's boyfriend's dog were on that ship in England and he told me that it was shady business. There was windows moving and paint wet where it shouldn't be and the insurance knew about it. And then I find out that the Richies are getting too sick a week before launch. And that means... Add it up, boy! <laughs> oh, you got any other work lined up? Well, I'm working a factory job right now. Oh, thank God! You stay there, and until that ship comes and goes, you'll stay out of this harbor if you know what's good for you. Let's go, boy. <laughs> Another day without Lewis. Well, it's not his fault. You know, I don't think he even knows any better. for new work anyway, weren't you, Lewis? But I'd take 25 cents of working on a ship any day. Ship? That great vessel setting sail before any of us the wiser. The, the Titanic? That's the one. Or is it? Are they all just playing us like a finely tuned fiddle? What's this all about, Lewis? I'll tell you what it's about, Helen. This is about money. This is about human lives. I heard from a man at the harbor that his friend comes his sister's brother work on the Titanic and the windows kept moving. And the Richie's get this, they know all about it. Like, I'm sure it's a scam. It's out this boat, which is actually the Olympic, and singing it is poor for the money. Yes, Helen? What about the lifeboats? Yes, the lifeboats. There aren't enough lifeboats oh, for everyone in Port Williams. One, we have work to do. Two, are you trying to tell us that a dog worked on the Titanic? Well, it's not a dog, dog, but it doesn't matter. We're back here. Is a disturbance? This level of conspiracy is quite disturbing. Would someone like to explain what's going on? Uh, yes. Yes. I Officer, I called you in. I set this boy up with a job, give him good pay, honest employment, and now he's trying to in incite some sort of crackpot rebellion against the Titanic of all things? Sir, with all due respect, the Titanic is a pretty shady business. Sure. <laughs> I would be surprised for the boy being disturbed. You think the Titanic is disturbing? I'll tell you what's disturbing. Kathy, Helen, how Kathy, Helen, and I, we've been here for two years hammering our hands to bits, making 25 cents. Meanwhile, Lewis just got here and he's making 40. Just last month, Dorothy did leave on a stretcher. Yeah, and I hear that her and her children in, are in the cold now. Ever since her husband died, no one wants to hire a single mother. When will we be fairly compensated for our labor performance? You put a new boy on the line and double his pay, and we've been busting our tail, tails for you for years now. Hold it, hold it. Girls, is this some kind of union? <laughs> no, babe. Girls, I am much older than you, but <laughs> maybe it is a union. Maybe it's time we unionize this floor. Rude. I can excuse conspiracy theorists, but I draw the line at reds. You're Robert. coming with me. Actually, 
I literally just had to grab a can of soup. Campbell saves the day yet again. Wait, you had to make your lunch? Why? Well, Barbara took a job as a telephone operator to uh, bring in some extra money, and we can't really afford to have her, you know, at home taking care of the house and Sam. My paycheck isn't cutting it anymore. You had to make your lunch. That's not your job. This is. It's not that wild, see. You know, I left, we left Sam, you know, at home with my cousin, and Barbara left at about seven, I left at eight, and that was that. But, look, if, we, if I don't start bringing in some extra money soon, I don't know what we're gonna do. Wow, you're really tight for cash, are you? It's not that, it's, I'm not making enough. We're, again, here long hours every day, and we're barely making anything to show for it. You boys do know that lunch ended 45 seconds ago. <laughs> Get to work. <laughs> All right, guys, closing time. Steve, Don, come get your pay. Sorry, I tried to vouch for a couple extra cents. Whoa, Henry, I knew it wasn't going to be 20 cents. But I wasn't expecting ten. Ten? Dude. Three cookies! I did her today with Auntie Georgia, and she let me have three cookies. <sighs> That's fantastic, sweetie. Auntie Georgia says it's just a matter of time before Dad loses his job, and his dignity, and the house, and you leave him. <sighs> what do you want for dinner? I was thinking tomato soup and steak tonight. Yeah, Auntie Georgia says it's a shame that's all we can afford. But maybe we can go out to the diner tomorrow and get burgers and milkshakes and fries? Yes, of course. We'll all go out tomorrow and get burgers, milkshakes, and fries. Mom, can I join the scouts? Excuse me? Can I join the scouts? You can't be serious. <laughs> oh, you're serious. Hey. Um, well, we'll see. Um, the uniforms they use are a bit expensive, and you and I both know that. Um, have you tried talking to Dad? I'd say maybe if I was good. Well, I think I can hear a certain dad pulling up into the driveway. Go hurry up and wash up before dinner. Okay. Welcome home, rough day. Ooh, how much did a man of the house make today? Tw buck 20. Yeah, 10 cent day. It's getting insane. So we can't take Sam out to the diner tomorrow. No. <laughs> uh, why, did you promise? Yeah. Maybe, you know, we'll do something at home. I'll invite Don and see if Mr. Henry wants to stop by. Yeah, check with him tomorrow and I'll get some hot dogs and hamburgers in the morning. Um, do we need anything else? Relish. But get the dill, not the sweet. Kids these days don't know the pain of sweet pickle relish. <laughs> <sighs> well, what are we gonna do, Steve? I don't know. <laughs> I'll talk to the head boss about it tomorrow or something. Why are you thinking? Well, <coughs> actually, I was thinking you could do what the railway boys are doing. You know, you could start a union. They can't unionize. They don't have the time. Well, sir, I think you should be careful. I've been hearing the workers thinking about fighting for more pay. Mr. Henry, tell me, what do you think of your paycheck? I like it. <laughs> then shut it before you lose your paycheck. Yes, sir. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about how we can increase our profits by at least 4%. We slashed wages a bit to hurt morale a little, and I suggest we don't do it again. Give them 15 hour days at five cents an hour. Let's make this easy, and just make all of the factories like that. Sir, slashing wages in 17 factories? That's a terrible idea. I mean, there could be uprising. Slash wages in 17 factories. <laughs> I love it. Let's make it happen, Henry. All right. Now, let's think. How can we cut expenses even more? We are opening an outlet store in Montana. Granted, we should just sell the whole state to uh, Canada. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's just an opinion. Selling Montana? That's an odd idea. Sir, I don't think we're selling Montana. Maybe. <laughs> idea. Let's get out there 
build a bunch of factories in Montana so we can get low, low American construction costs. Then we call up the Canadians <laughs> to sell Montana and reap the benefits. Plus, our employees will get a better economy and free health care. Sell Montana to the Canadians. Make money. smelling that next paycheck a little low? Yep. No. Well, you didn't hear it from me, but uh, Penny's thinking about slashing the wages even more, uh, much to everyone's surprise. Y'all should start a union. More? How is that even legal? I live alone, and I can barely afford my rent as it is. And I would like to stop making my own lunch, but sitting here doing nothing isn't going to help. <coughs> Penny? Yes, we should do something. Well, don't look at me. I'm just a human resource guy. I mean, <laughs> you know. I think yeah. You boys. <laughs> you boys. Oh, these spikes and falls are good for morale. You guys want to start a union against J.C. Penny? You boys are funny. No, hear me out. What does a union need? People, Penny's employees. Well, you need people. I mean, I'm HR. I guess I can get the word out to other workers. <coughs> you know, you boys should pick it outside the factory and get a union to work together to stand up for justice and economic rights. I got it. <laughs> we'll start a union. We'll work slower, despite the increase in work time. And we'll just give away the products for free. Yeah. Uh, we're so clever. <laughs> they think they're so clever, huh? So who's the ringleader? of this whole thing. I want the people who are responsible for my lack of funding. My hedges need the money and my Swiss bank account. If you put your money in offshore accounts, then you don't have to pay taxes on it. Well, it's more like people from different parts of the company. The legal department is in a frenzy. There are workers, drivers, receptionists down there picketing for a union. I've heard stories that the the Canadians are down there. Get the finance team and the hockey team. We'll deal with this one problem at a time. First, what the hell do they want? Well, it seems like they like to set a work schedule, as well as a set hourly rate or even a salary. Salary? Salary? These men want a what? Well, it would help make finances easier. We just need to change the Excel budget and we'll be good. Listen, just get me the people who are speaking on behalf of these freeloaders up here and we'll talk. My wallet is sad and empty. He hasn't been fed in a week. <laughs> I'll give you a moment. Ah, Mr. Penny, we're glad you decided to speak with us. Uh, well, I am a very wonderful boss for giving you this chance. Now, night. <laughs> Dude, I'm sorry. He does that very infrequently. Look, we wanted to speak with you because we could barely afford to live. That just sucks. Maybe you should try having an uberly successful monopoly over an industry. Then you'll be, afford to be able to afford to live. See. We can't do that. We're here long hours every day. We don't know how long we're gonna be here. We take home $2 in a day if we're lucky. If you were to help us be happier, we would be more inclined to work harder for you. Why should I care about your happiness? Who cares about 
you? <clears throat> well, if you don't help us, we'll have we call in some Mounties to clean this place out. I mean, really, Penny, look at the charts. If the workers keep protesting, we, I mean, you are set to lose money. How are you going to afford those indoor tennis courts in your second house? Or those daily champagne baths and cucumber facials? <laughs> <sighs> well, if you get those unionizers and Canadians <laughs> off my property, then you have a deal. Don, tell the boys that Mr. Penny here decides that Vancouver Canucks are a good team. Because of Steve and Don's efforts, the minimum wage became a reality and the eight hour workday was established. Disclaimer, this is not how it actually happened. Also, Canada did not play a part in the formation and creation of the minimum wage or the eight hour workday, but they really do have universal health care. In 1926, the five day work week with a 40 hour maximum was implemented. The US ended up setting up minimum breaks and created a minimum wage of 25 cents an hour in 1938. <laughs> This is the breakfast crew. <laughs> Ma'am, Chronicles just got executed in the morning last today. It's time they commit. Well, I had to go on another set with the man doing blackface. He claimed he saw one named Thomas Rice, whoever that is. <laughs> At least your dad didn't have to work on a railroad and be treated like garbage for 24 hours straight. Hey, quiet, all of you. This is detention, not opera. Jeez. the hall here, so I don't expect any funny business. You mess with the bull kids, you get the horn. <laughs> Anyways, you were saying something about someone on set doing blackface. Oh yeah, apparently Thomas Rice is some big minstrel performer. My director thought it was a good concept to bring him on set and use his ideas. Not everyone's doing blackface, even the governor of Virginia. I heard about this. You're in that new upcoming Broadway show, right? Supposedly, but if my director wants to use his racist ass, uh, your girl's out. <laughs> what? Uh, nothing. I just get what you mean. This country had Chinese people like my dad build an entire railroad with very little pay and poor working conditions. Did what? My dad always talked about the constant physical abuse that the workers were put through. They were beaten, mocked, and they definitely didn't get a breakfast break. White supremacy, am I right? Right? Americans took my country away from me and treat me like I wasn't even the queen of an island. They call themselves the Great American Melting Pot, but they don't want to be adding any seasoning to it. <laughs> don't get me started on the seasoning. They should really thank us instead of treating us like we're the root of all their problems. 
taking their treats. Um, anybody else? I brought cookies. What? No, you can't have those. And not here, Principal Duncan said Principal that. Principal Duncan can eat my shorts. <laughs> oh, yeah. Cookies? The woman has baked goods? Do you always carry around cookies in your backpack? Only on Saturdays. <laughs> what? You never seen a cookie before? I. Maybe gluten free. Also, I couldn't really afford it. <laughs> so chicks can't call their gluten. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I am so popular. Do you know how many subjects I have? Everyone loves me so much. You're so conceited, Lily Oklahoma, and you're so conceited! Well, are you gonna eat the cookie or stir it like it's some Van Gogh painting? I don't know if I want to. Just eat the cookie, Suzanne! No, yeah, Suzanne, this is cookie's mom. Eat it. Eat it! <laughs> I come in here. I'm coughing skull. to just lock us away in detention. So what you're saying is all of us are just here for speaking out? Yeah. Well, well that checks out. children that doesn't even begin to describe me. I went to medical school. I built a hotel with acid vats and secret passages and I was so charming no one suspected a thing. All anyone ever remembers anymore is the murder. <laughs> AJ Paul, right? Mm -hmm. I just want to know, how does one become a serial killer? You want to become a serial killer? What you activists fail to understand is that society is not worth saving. People are simple, selfish, petty creatures. By the way, that clock is twenty minutes fast. <laughs> <coughs> well, that was really weird. <laughs> So 
Okay, now shut up. Hey guys, if you were to see me around school, would you acknowledge me? You want the truth? Yeah, I want the truth. I don't think so. Oh, that's a real nice attitude. Oh, be honest, Ansel. If Suzanne came up to you on the street, what would you do? You'd say hi to her, and then the second she left, you'd laugh about her with all your labor union friends. Probably. <laughs> Okay, but what if I came up to you? The same exact thing? Oh, you bitch! Why, because I'm telling the truth? That makes me a bitch? No, because you know how shitty it is to do to someone, yet you do it anyway! <laughs> exactly. Wait, I, I, don't, I don't understand. Of course you don't. What do you mean, of course I don't? Not me. Would never want to end up like them. Oh, we don't have a choice. As you grow old, your heart just sort of dies. Yeah, but who cares, really? I care. I don't want to go through all of this. Protesting school, don't work a basic ass nine to five just for me to be a better old lady? <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, it's not like I'm going to go anywhere in life. It's like dozens of people are masked in the market, right? Probably just get executed like my uncle. Well, I'd want to be one of those old people that you see in timeshare commercials or brochures, happy and carefree. <laughs> so, Suzanne, are you going to write this novel for us? No. So your girl is out of here. Sweet, me too. You guys actually expect me to write this essay? Or this novel? Well, you know, life is what you make of it. So, you know, write as much as you want, buddy. Screw this. I'm out of here, too. <sighs> Damn activists. I'm invincible, don't they? minutes and 43 seconds inside of detention for whatever it is that we did wrong. But we think it's crazy that you're making us write a novel to you telling who we are. You see us in the simplest terms, the most convenient definitions. So instead, you're getting a paragraph. Today we found out that each one of us is a queen, a rabble rouser, a diva, a foreigner, and a savior. We thought you could bury us. We were just the seeds. Yours, Yours truly, truly, The, the breakfast, breakfast Crew. Good evening. Shelf Life welcomes you. Hey to Johnstown. The Johnstown flood of 1889. Thousands died, lost to time. Benjamin Ugh, uh, Disgusting. Was my song really that bad? I liked it. Not your song. Some kid stuck chewing gum all over my beautiful pages. Oh no. I think I'm gonna be sick. All is lost. Your pages don't look that bad. Into the garbage you go, never to be seen again. Death comes to us all, but so soon, so soon. Calm down, Johnstown, you're not helping. All right, let's have a look at you. I'm sure it's nothing the librarian can't fix. You think you're the first book in this library to get stuck with 
chewing gum? But my pages. Good day, good day. <laughs> to all I say, good day. No doubt you wonder why I come this way. Yes. So far from my own <laughs> section I do stray. In brief tidings bring I. Some ill, some gay. Seattle, General Strike, are you okay? What malady befalls your form today? Some kid gummed up my pages. Alack, allay. Is he okay? Why are we all talking this way? <laughs> His poetic energy. It's leading our tongues astray. This is weird. Poetry book, just say what you came to say. <laughs> my fellows, Emmett Till and old Jim Crow, hello. But please, I ask, just call me Poe. <laughs> Okay, we need to break out of this. What rhymes not with Poe? I can't think of anything. No, no, no. My banjo lost in the flood and flow. We're a history book, damn it. We don't talk in, in verse. Aha, you did it. We're free from this hearse. You better start talking before we send you home in a hearse. The message came from yonder shelves this morning. All over the library, they speak this warning. When strikes the clock to signal end of day, librarians cometh, and us their prey. I knew it, I knew it, we're doomed, we're doomed. Now, now, settle down, let's not jump to assume. Our cover's dull under the weight of dust. Our pages yellow, curling from disuse. The students look upon us with disgust, regarding us like odious refuse. Instead of books, they use computer things. And blast, librarians are on their side. They plan to clear us out. Oh, how it stings. And in our place, computers will reside. So you're saying they're going to get rid of us to make room for more computers? And any minute comes our persecutors. Is there nothing that can be done? Once the dam broke, the water couldn't be outrun. You said you had tidings, some ill, some gay. So what's the good news? A plan I have been given by the muse. Gather round and listen for your cues. An ode of my own composition will reveal the keyboards weaker than the quill. Be quick, stand fast, we're running out of time. Ugh, I can feel the gum up in my spine. We're doomed. He's coming. Ow. At once, I say, you grasp at greatness, grubby-handed poison asp. Have you no sense of our aesthetic worth? Would you see us cruelly return to earth? How can your callous heart contain such dearth in its capacity to see beauty? But you care not for art, for art's own sake. Our tactile essence you would unmake. We will have our revenge, make no mistake. Comrades, to arms! Commence the insurrection! Yeah! A poetry book? You're in the wrong section. <laughs> I told you! We're doomed! At least we don't have to talk in rhymes anymore. What do we do? What do we do? Brace yourself. He's coming around again. If he fixed me, I was on her for sure. <laughs> Jim Crow and convict leasing and vigilantism? In the case of Emmett Till? I don't suppose vigilantism could be referring to Batman in this instance. Don't get cute with me. You know exactly what it means. Mob rule? Lynching? Emmett Till murdered at 14! God, I'm depressed just skimming this. Oh, come on! Don't give a damn! We don't want to hear your white guilt. If you don't like what we have to say, then do something about it. Yeah, get angry, girl. Convict leasing, a problem of the past. Do we really need this piece of history? Forget history, it's part of our present. Convict leasing, not a problem. It's that line of thinking that led to this new form of slavery in the post-Civil War America. You, you and your whiteness, clouding your vision, packing your blind spots onto the kids you teach, telling them these aren't problems anymore because they don't exist, because you fixed them, you didn't fix anything. You just called it a different name. So convict leasing maybe got a name, but its spirit lives on through the mass incarceration of people of color. All you do is hide behind your privilege instead of trying to overcome it and fight it. And it doesn't take a genius to draw a line between Emmett Till and Trayvon Martin. Yo, you that boy talking? 
scared. Don't yell me. I'll blow your head off. Get your clothes on. Damn it, buddy. Pull it together. It's slipping. All right. All right. So let's get real. The world needs us. You need us. This is the problem nowadays. People keep saying they're woke, but are we? Is it time, Jim? Jim, I'm not ready. It's gonna be okay. I'm right here with you. They'll never win because we fight. Win? How, how do we win, Jim? Don't you see? We're being forgotten. The librarian is gonna throw us away now. We win because we fight, which means they never win. We are the spark that lights the fire that never dies. We are the thorn in their side. They can try and throw us away, but behind every one survivor, there's an army of change. <coughs> Fights the gum. Ah, he's looking at me. Shh, it's okay. He'll all be okay. <laughs> no! The Johnstown Flood of 1889? Never heard of that. Yeah, most people don't know about me. That doesn't mean I'm not important. Or that's what my friends say. They say just because you're a lesser known event doesn't mean you don't have a lot to teach the world about corporate greed or avoidable disasters. They also say, could you please stop playing your banjo so late at night? I wonder what they mean by that. <laughs> Benjamin Ruff? Sounds like some name some actor would have. I wonder who he was. The worst, that's who he was, the worst. He's the one that fought the dam after the government gave up on it and cut corners everywhere. If it wasn't for him, the dam might not flood it. I guess that makes him the villain in my story. You like villains, right? Come on, my story's got everything. Drama, tragedy, water. <laughs> Please don't throw me in the bin. Hmm. I don't know about this one. No, wait, my history is being watered down and washed away. 2,200 people died and those responsible never face the repercussions. Someone has to speak for the drowned. Ugh. Don't be afraid. No, no, I don't like this. All the other books are gone. How can we be so calm? Worrying won't change anything. If we run off into directions, how will they be able to catch? Oh, local history. Neat. <laughs> <laughs> One of us. Just play it cool, and maybe he won't notice the gum. Seattle General Strike of 1919. Hmm. Play it cool. <laughs> right. <laughs> Actually, I prefer Denny. General strike is so formal. <laughs> oh, it was just the uh, centennial. Look at that. Listen to me. Why don't you just um, read that black quote there and uh, don't turn any more pages, okay? You want to know the story behind it? Don't turn any more pages, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you. 30,000 shipyard wor workers, 65,000 other workers on strike so much without a fist fight? They say a black quote's worth a thousand words. Why don't you give that one another read? Really digest it. I wonder what happens next. No! Seattle workers returned to their jobs. The strike had been a total failure, and they all knew it. In the days to come, it was, uh, they would learn it was worse than a failure. It was a complete disaster. Do you think I wanted all those crackdowns? No, I didn't want anyone to get hurt. I was completely nonviolent. Violence didn't happen until afterward. Please, you have to believe me. It wasn't my fault. It was the police. It wasn't my fault. I'm not a failure. Benny, relax. Breathe. Remember what we worked on. I am not a failure. I am a magnificent, important, powerful event. And I am redefining what success means for me. And I'll admit it. I made some mistakes, Ron. I could have been more specific with my demands. But they don't give me enough credit for the things that I did right. I fed people, you know? I kept the hospitals running. I patrolled the streets. Nobody got in trouble. No one, no one, not even a fist fight. I just think I deserve a little more credit. That's all. This is depressing. See, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Wig, what are you? Chewing gum? No! <laughs> My horrible secret review! Why did you have to turn the page? Oh, kids these days. Better clean after I finish this shelf. <coughs> John Dewey and the Progressive Era of Education? Uh, most folks just call me Ed. <laughs> We've got a lot of books on John Dewey. What makes this one worth keeping? 
don't you think students should have the opportunity to navigate the education system they're navigating through, its origins, its alternatives? There's a lot of books about John Dewey because he was an influential guy. Y'all ever hear the phrase experiential learning? Like when a bunch of students perform weird plays about history instead of just reading a textbook? <laughs> yeah, Dewey was way into that sort of thing. Uh, I, you can get digitized with the rest of them, I guess. It's time for my break. Digitization? Digitization? What does that even mean? We're not doomed? Are we gonna be in the computers? I wonder what that feels like, not being bound up in paper. I, I bet it will feel free, like flying. Or maybe it'll be glass boat. I mean, you know how many books they can fit in one computer? How do they get them all in there? I don't know, Jim, but I guess we're going to find out. Well, I'm not excited. Not, not at all. <laughs> Without a solid form, from grace will fall. The worth of books is that they're beautiful. Compressed to pixels on a screen? Why, it's obscene. Without our souls, we'll lose our wits. Without our wit, we have no worth at all. This digitization is our downfall. <laughs> Do we have to spend an eternity trapped in the computer with this guy? You're wrong, Poe. You may be able to get away with that sort of thing in the poetry section, but I think there they'd admit that there's more to books than just aesthetics. That we history books may not be beautiful, but we've got value, all right. Yeah, you tell him. Uh, what value can there be in history presented on a screen? No mystery to keep the reader leafing through our pages when there's a search bar present at all stages. Why are you so afraid of change? The value of history is in its usefulness. If we're not useful, we're nothing. Worse than nothing. Academic. If being digital means that more people can learn from our stories, then I say it's a good thing. Well, that was gross. Yes, he's clean and pretty good! Hey, oh, yeah. so. And guess what else? I heard the librarian talking about a new centennial edition of me with pictures! Congratulations! <laughs> well, Maybe being in a computer won't be so bad after all. What do you say, Poe? You gonna spend eternity feeling sorry for yourself? I'd rather spend it on a solid shelf. 